Wonderful, we're here. Um, so anyway, uh, well, uh, thanks so much uh, for having me. It's, it's an honor uh, to be here. It's, it's really exciting. Um, so I want to kind of open, th this, this is really my dream, um, is essentially can we, use, uh, can we use cloud computing to essentially build, uh, if you will, essentially a room that summarizes everything that's happening around the planet. Um, every riot, protest, coup, uh, every peace appeal, every diplomatic exchange, essentially monitor the planet uh, and put all that into a single room that shows us what's happening around the world each day uh, and how people are feeling around that each moment. Um, so I always like to open with a story, and, and, and I always like to open in particular with, with, with um, you know, a picture of this beautiful planet. And you think about this planet, uh, you know, if you think about this story, because four and a half billion years ago, the creation of this beautiful planet called Earth, a few billion years went by till early humans, uh, till, sorry, till early uh, life starts, about a billion years go by till early life starts swimming around, a few more billion years go by till about 50,000 years ago the first humans start walking around. And the reason this is so exciting is that within 10,000 years of the first human, the first sort of modern human and start walking around, they start leaving, the first surviving evidence of cave paintings start showing up. Those early humans, almost from, from day one, are trying to leave a permanent record of what's happening around them, how they're feeling, sort of daily lives, chronicling those daily lives. Uh, and of course, you know, fast forward to today, uh, and we live in an incredible time. Uh, you know, electricity is, is constantly moving to every, to, is moving further and further across the globe. And what's exciting about this is with the spread of electricity, it's, it's probably a little bit hard to see on, on this map. Um, but essentially, red and white are areas where there's geotag social media um, and electricity. Um, blue are areas where there's more, there's basically electricity without geotag social media. And you can see outside of a few areas that, prim you know, primarily countries that ban social media, uh, by and large, the most remote pocket of power, uh, say in, in rural Africa, uh, brings with it connection to this global network. And this is exciting because as more and more of the world uh, is, is becoming interconnected, is, is sort of live journaling the world around them, this means we can capture this by computer. We can process this and understand uh, what's happening across the globe. Uh, and, and I always love this particular image. Um, this is the election of the new pope in 2005. If you think about it, 2005 wasn't that long ago, uh, but yet we only have this one little camera phone down here in the corner. <laughs> Uh, and, and you think about, you know, 2013, you think about today, we all pull out our camera phones and we take pictures. And it's really hard to think that it wasn't that long ago that, that camera phones were still rare and people didn't do that. And what's so exciting in 2013, and of course I love the, the iPad down there, um, but what's so interesting about this is in 2013, you think about all these people are probably live chronicling that out there. They're tweeting, you know, uh, uh, Instagramming, Facebooking, etc. They're putting out every one of these views out into media where we can capture and understand how people are contextualizing and viewing this, this event. Um, this is a very interesting graph. This is a percentage of all news media worldwide, um, print, broadcast, etc., across all languages, all corners of the earth, that was available via the web as of two th um, over time. As of 2010, uh, almost half of all news media worldwide was available via the web. The reason this is important is if you have, for example, a, a, a rural broadcaster, a community broadcaster in a, in a rural corner of a country, um, you, know, you, you can't get at that unless you're physically there listening to the radio or television. The moment it's on the web, you can scoop it up. It doesn't matter if this is in, you know, down town Moscow or if this is in, in, in rural Australia, um, the moment it's on the web we can access it, we can, we, we can process it by computer. Uh, and, and I always love this image. This, this image actually comes from uh, the centennial of our nation. Uh, one of the big railroads uh, ran this picture because at the time period, delivery by, of mail by um, the railroad had, had, was, was still hot technology. So imagine, you know, this is the day when it was, it was state of the art that as the train stopped at your you know, city, you could put an envelope in that train and it could get there, you know, in California that evening. And this was state of the art. I mean, information was moving faster than we could imagine. Of course, it's, it's quaint to think of that. But, you know, the, to really think about you know, this, this movement of, of information is, is accelerating faster and faster and faster. Um, and in particular, what I'm very interested in is, is how do we take, you know, how do we go from this, you know, television across the world and, and this information, you know, all these perspectives flowing in from across the planet and go to something like this, a live map that's telling us what's in all this, this news across the world, you know, as, as we look across all the world's material, what's actually happening? How do we drill down and, and, and sort of view that on a map? Uh, and if, if we were ever at a point where we could start to measure sort of the heartbeat of, of global society, we're, we're fast approaching that. You think about, you know, the first capture of Osama bin Laden, uh, you know, or sorry, um, the, the, live, the super secret takedown of Osama bin Laden was live tweeted uh, by a Pakistani journalist who said, you know, there's foreign, there's, there's strange non-Pakistani military helicopters flying overhead. 
uh, you know, it was confirmed here in the U.S. by a former administration official who, who tweeted and said, uh, you know, I just heard from my friend in the White House, we got him. Uh, you know, confirmation of Gaddafi's uh, capture was a cell phone video shot by participants on the ground. And so what I'm really interested in is, is you think about today, you know, if, if there's an earthquake anywhere on this planet, with, with all the sensors that all the different governments have put across the, across the world, um, we know instantly, within seconds, where that earthquake is, its magnitude, um, who's going to be affected, and so on. But what if we want to make a database of, say, all the, hum the, sort of the, the human earthquakes, the protests, the coups across the world? Um, and this is really what, what, what launched my project, which was this, this notion of how do we essentially you know, take what we've done for the natural earth? Uh, and be able to do it for human society. Be able to essentially, it, I mean, again, news and, and social media and all these other forms, they're imperfect. They, they don't capture all society. Um, but they capture a better and better view of what's happening around the world. And imagine if we could use computers to essentially scoop all that up. What could we do with that? Uh, and so essentially what the project does is, is each day uh, it scoops up um, a large fraction of all media worldwide, print broadcast web, over a hundred languages. Um, and that's a combination of both using human translation uh, and then also a grant from Google Translate for research, uh, which is actually uh, quite interesting, the, the Google Translate API. Uh, what's very interesting is, is, you know, when we think about machine translation, we, you know, most of us probably would say, well, you know, machine translation isn't, isn't quite there yet. It makes mistakes. But it turns out machine translation is actually quite systematic over time. Over over time. So if you take, for example, um, you know, all Russian news media coming out uh, each day, and you translate all of that material each day, you see very systematic, uh, you know, the areas where, again, machine translation is not perfect, but the areas it has are very systematic. Uh, and it turns out that, that we're actually able to model a lot of those issues out. And, and what's interesting, especially uh, uh, and about things like translation, uh, is um, certain, certain languages uh, factual information comes through, the grammar, so we know precisely what happened, but we don't know how people are feeling about it. Other languages, um, emotion comes through very, very strongly, uh, but we don't necessarily know what's physically happening because the grammar gets really, really distorted. And there hasn't been that much work. Most of the work on machine translation has really been focusing on um, how, do we, how do we take a document and translate it for human consumption, not how do we take a document, translate it for another computer to process it. Um, so that's been a, a big area of work. So you can imagine sort of you know, trying to scoop up the world's media each day, um, and then processing that. Well, what do you do with all this media that's pouring in? Well, we do two things. Um, one is we come into each article and, and take this, this top article, for example. Iraqi leaders criticize Turkey uh, for bombing a Kurdish militants. Um, and so essentially what, what's happening there is that article is, is saying two things. One, um, Iraq criticized Turkey. And two, the reason they're doing it is because Turkey bombed some, some Kurdish militants. And so what the machine does, it goes through this and actually extracts out. And it recognizes about 300 categories of, of events. So riots, protests, peace appeals, diplomatic exchanges, and so on. And so essentially this textual news article becomes essentially a, a spreadsheet that lists uh, each day uh, essentially an Excel spreadsheet. It says, here's, here's according to the world's news media that we're able to monitor, here's a list of what's happening around the world each day. Um, now this allows it to do things, for example, as, as Egypt was coming, was unraveling at the seams last year, um, and it's a little bit hard to see here, uh, but essentially make a live map that was reporting in real time, um, here's what the world's media is saying uh, about what's happening in Egypt right now. So you could drill into that map, you could see literally as, as protests were breaking out in places, you would literally see that uh, break on that map. Uh, you could drill down and click on that and say, wow, what, what's happening down here, and, and have access to all that media. So you can imagine sort of the, the notion of Google News was sort of inverted where you're not delivering articles, you're actually delivering you know, insights, actually saying that you know here's you know here are a thousand articles that are reporting on this massive protest here there's you know 10,000 people in this square uh, these are the reasons they're protesting here are some of the protest leaders that you know are waving to the crowd in this area here are comments of support from across the world um, and that latter part is also very interesting so in addition to extracting the factual information of, of what this article is telling us is happening um, also going into each article and pulling out all the people organizations companies uh, locations over 2,200 emotions and themes out of that. So we can start going through, for example, and I'll come back to this in a minute, but we can start looking at, for example, when a certain leader, uh, every time that they say something, what actually changes on the ground? So, for example, if, if someone criticizes what, you know, uh, the president of, of Syria, um, does, he, does he change at all? And, and what you find is, for example, if, if Putin says something, um, things do change a little bit on the ground in Syria. If, if, say, Obama says something, things don't usually change. And so what you can do is, is, is you can start building. And these are the things that, you know, we, we kind of see implicitly 
implicitly, uh, implicitly. But what's fascinating is that the machine can start learning all this over time. It could say, you know, Obama keeps criticizing all these things around the world and nothing's changing in these areas. But these, these couple, when they say something, things change. So we can start understanding, because you think about it, you know, and, and you know, when people talk about influence, they usually talk about things like, you know, social media influence. Well, how many followers do you have on Twitter? Um, well, you know, Justin Bieber may have, you know, some enormous number of followers, uh, but I don't think that his views on foreign policy have a, have a huge impact on, on society. Uh, you know, if he says, wow, we should all have peace uh, here in Syria, I, I don't know how much, you know, sort of weight that has. Um, and, and so what, what we can do here is, is actually look at um, when, what do, you know, at least, at least through the eyes of the news media uh, and other forms, when certain leaders say things, when, when a business elite or a politician or a reporter um, says something, what changes on the ground? What are the connections that influence? And I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Um, so what we can do, so you can imagine, okay, so we're, we're scooping up all the, you know, well not all, because there's no such thing as all the world's media, but we're scooping up a fr an, an ever-increasing fraction of the world's media each day. Then we're translating as much of that as we can each day into English. And then we're processing that. We're extracting out this factual information, and we're extracting out all this, this sort of metadata, if, if you will, sort of a metadata and a, sort of an annotation over the world's news media. Well, with the event data, we can do neat things. For example, we can map out Ukraine. So pink are protests, uh, red are, are physical conflicts. And we can actually map out Ukraine. Um, uh, and this, this particular map actually hails, this, actually, this map was done the day before the president of Ukraine fled. Um, and this is where I think data can be so exciting, uh, is this particular map, um, this is Crimea down here, um, and then this is, is Eastern Ukraine, and there's some other maps that went with this. And what these maps show, mind you, this was done uh, for one of my foreign policy columns the day before the president fled uh, of Ukraine, and what it said was, you know, Crimea is really pulling apart from mainland um, um, uh, Ukraine. Uh, it's really pro-Russia, everything's really boiling over right there. Um, and this got a very negative reaction uh, from many senior people here in, in Washington saying, well, that can't possibly be the case. The president, you know, he just signed a peace deal with the protesters. They're already pulling out of the main square. Ukraine is now at peace. Um, and again, I don't think that that was, you know, an intelligent affair. I think a lot of that was, you know, the wishful thinking that happens in this town. Um, you know, just because you, just because you want it to be the case doesn't mean it happens. Um, but I think this is, this is one of the exciting things of, of all this data that we have. If you imagine, you know, scooping up the, as much of the kind of the world's, inf of the world's media, and then being able to, you know, imagine essentially taking Google News. I mean, this is far more, because this is broadcast and print in other languages. But imagine the simple example of taking Google News each day and basically shoveling that onto a map. And being able to instantly see not just, you know, hear the top stories, but, but really what's happening geographically around the world. You know, where are things increasing or decreasing in stability? And in Ukraine's case, um, you know, the devil's advocate of you may think that Ukraine is now at peace and, and everything's going away, uh, but you know the, the, the media, certainly the domestic media in Ukraine, is showing things are actually unraveling at, a, at an ever-increasing rate. Um, and the ability then also, um, this, so the ability to sort of watch the world uh, live, and this is actually um, um, a little bit larger timestamps, um, but actually um, in a few days uh, we're going to be announcing uh, that, it up, that it will begin updating every 15 minutes. So you literally um, are able to do things like this, like literally basically park in, in say Google Earth or something like that, and literally watch the world go by. Um, and that I think is, is a fundamental excitement. You think, we think about like satellite imagery and, and the ability to watch the world from, from space, but the ability to really watch, uh, you know, human society. And, and things, um, what's also very interesting about things like Nigeria, some of the newer stuff, you can actually see uh, Boko Haram move through the country. In a case like uh, Iraq, uh, what's so really fascinating about, about watching things at this resolution uh, is you can actually see in a case like Iraq with ISIS or, and, and Syria, uh, with ISIS, ISIL, you can actually see the areas where terror groups are actually following traditional Iraqi military tactics versus areas where they're, they're following uh, different tactics, which can kind of tell you where are different elements, debathification versus um, um, uh, foreign fighters, uh, but essentially the ability to, to really sort of have a, a satellite eye view and, and reimagine things. Um, this was another piece of well, what if we took all the world's media that we could monitor for a day about the Mexican drug cartels uh, and make a heat map that says um, where are all the locations in the U.S. and Mexico that are discussed inside of news coverage uh, about, uh, so basically take all the world's coverage for a day that we can get uh, that mention the drug cartels go through that poll at every location, mention that, and make a heat map. And it turns out this actually matched um, the, the Drug Enforcement Agency's uh, map of, the, of, their, of their presence within the U.S. very, very strongly at this time period. So there's so much that's, that's hidden in media that we have just begun to be able to unlock. 
um, influence. So, so going back to the influencer stuff, you know, the ability to, to make diagrams where each of these is a person and all the connections are how they're interconnected according to the news media uh, and then color coded based on the natural communities that they form. So being able to take uh, social network analysis, um, you know, not social network as in you know, Facebook, Twitter, but SNA as in, as in sort of the methodological um, and, and uh, theoretical constructs that define our current understanding of how societies function, how people interact, and be able to use the news media as a data source for that. And you think about you know, so much of the work today is, well, I looked on Twitter and I look who's, who's retweeting whom and I made a network diagram of that. That's great. That may tell you the most powerful people and all those interconnections on Twitter. What I'm, le you know, I'm less interested in that and I'm more interested in, in you know, what, is, what can we actually capture about human society and the interactions between people on the ground and, and news media is, 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 is certainly a more powerful entrance point to that. Um, and then, of course, scaling up and, and trying to process the entire planet. So this particular diagram um, in 2013 uh, took basically every person that we found in the news media in 2013 and basically made a gigantic network diagram over all that. And of course, you know, this, this is more abstract art uh, to some degree, uh, but um, what you can actually do is as you start drilling into here, you can actually start identifying um, how people exist. So take a, a random person like uh, Edward Snowden uh, and you can actually uh, see his high centrality in the news in 2013 across the world. And uh, you can see people like Barack Obama, and there's all these other world leaders in here. Um, and that really reflects the fact that uh, you know, through his disclosures, um, you know, the media and, and other information around the world, he became highly, highly interconnected uh, to all that. Um, so again, you know, the notion of, of, of sort of taking you know, this, this big pile, you know, if, I keep coming back to the Google News metaphor, but you know, sort of that notion of taking this, this massive pile of news and transforming it to a network diagram like this. Now again, news media is imperfect. You know, no one's ever going to say that you know, the, the news is a perfect replication of, of everything that occurs on, on, you know, on the planet each day. You know, news is incredibly biased. Um, but it's incredible, you know, the, the ability for the first time, you, I mean, it, you know, news media is, is not a new thing. We, we've had news, uh, you know, some, some incarnation of news for, you know, since the dawn of society. But we have the computing, the computing capabilities today uh, to really start peeling back those layers and try and understand what is it telling us about human society. Um, this is another project I did um, with uh, NBC Universal. Um, they had a new television show on the sci-fi channel called Opposite Worlds. And what, what was very interesting about this is, is they had the, essentially the, the mandate um, that they were interested in um, was, um, you know, if you think about the, the, if you think about the, you know, what is the point of television? Well, you know, the model of television is give the viewers what they want. Um, well, what if you could go through and, and look at all the social media that was, that was, you know, all the social media discussion about your show and actually see, uh, basically take that and actually live steer your show in real time based on what people want. So if people want this to happen, actually have that really happen on the show. Um, so this was a, a, a show that they came up with called Opposite. It was basically a reality show. Um, but what was interesting is essentially we looked at what people were saying online about all the characters and then came up with these, with these essentially a popularity index that actually then altered and fed back in, in real time into the show. Um, and this required really rethinking how we measure emotion and think about that online. Um, but what's interesting is, is as this starts spreading around Washington, um, I start getting all these, these emails and calls and, and, um, from, from a lot of the embassies in town saying, well, if you could do this for a television show, could you do this for our head of state? You know, if I'm some country, I want to know, you know, how is my head of state compared to other heads of state? So, uh, welcome to the World Leaders Index. Um, so essentially what we started doing uh, was going through each day and basically looking at um, all the, the global coverage about each head of state and the second in command of each country uh, and measuring how positive or negative uh, that coverage is across the world. Um, and this is a little bit older, um, I forgot what date this actually comes from. Uh, but what you can actually do with this then, um, and I should add, this has a specific um, piece to it that it doesn't just look at positivity, it looks at also what's known as invulnerability, which, for example, no one would say the president of Syria is a really good guy who's, you know, who's doing wonderful things. Uh, most people would probably say he's, he's done some bad things. Uh, but in terms of invulnerability, in other words, his ability to sort of act without consequence, um, that is very high at this point. Um, and so it turns out, actually, if you, if you measure this out, if you take someone like Assad and you graph him out over time, uh, it turns out it actually, actually gives you incredible views onto his tactics. Basically, when the world begins darkening and really plunging against him, uh, that's when he, he in, in, in his sort of global news tone drops off a cliff, that's when he does things like the chemical weapons attacks or barrel bombs or other big scale attacks. Um, and again, it's not that he's watching the news and saying, ooh, people are mean to me, I'm going to do something bad. It's that the media is, is really sort of proxying and capturing the fact that he's losing. You know, they're, they're sort of 
they're, they're sort of tapped into that pulse of society. Um, so again, you know, that notion of, of taking the news and saying, well, what if we could use it as, as sort of a, a popularity index, uh, you know, albeit a, a very coarse one. Um, but the ability to, again, keep, keep rolling back these layers. Um, and what if we move beyond positive negative? You know, when people talk about emotion, they usually say positive negative. But you know, psychologists, they don't talk about you know, emotions. They, they talk about these things, you know, they talk about much deeper things. Essentially, how do, you know, what are the sort of the, how does the world and the things around you, um, how are they impacting your, your current state and your interpretation of the world? You know, they, they have phrases like hedonic signals and these types of things. Um, well, that got me, you know, very interested in, well, what if we were to move beyond positive and negative and, and basically go out there and say, what is every possible, uh, you know, emotional dimension that someone has built a piece of software to measure right now? Um, could we essentially acquire every last one of those and essentially measure every, every known dimension that psychologists have identified today from the news every day? Um, and again, uh, you know, some measures are more accurate than others, um, but this is a start. So thus far, I've assembled about 2,238 emotions and themes, so that's everything from anxiety fear of the future, uh, you know, uh, inevitability, you know, these very complex um, uh, pieces that, so you think about Ebola, for example, um, you know, very rarely are you going to see an article, a news article that says Ebola is a great disease, you should all try it. Uh, you know, most coverage is going to be negative about Ebola. But what you want is you want to be able to separate out articles that say Ebola is a very, a very deadly disease from oh my God, you know, are we, are we going to get it to, oh my God, we're all going to die. You want to be able to measure that progression from negativity to anxiety to panic. Um, and those are very distinct emotions. And you think about if you're a government, for example, trying to reassure your citizens, you want people to be concerned about it. You want them to, to take safeguards, but you don't want them to be in, to have abject panic about it. Um, so this, this particular graph is um, American domestic television. Um, so all the major networks uh, over the last, uh, what is this, four years. Um, and this is actually a plot of, of the the emotion of anxiety. Uh, and you can actually see, of course, the government shut down you know, this, this nice uh, uh, peak here. Um, and this becomes very really fascinating because actually um, tone, you see uh, very strong differences um, between Republican and Democratic press and a lot of other, and some people actually, some press was actually very positive about the, about the shutdown. Uh, there were certain elements of, of the American political sphere that wanted that shutdown. Um, but regardless of whether people were for or against it, there was enormous amounts of anxiety surrounding them. Well, what's going to happen? You know, now that we're in, you know, that it may happen and, and if it does happen, what's, gonna, what, you know, what's the impact of that going to be? So this ability to, to really start, again, peeling back these layers. Uh, good question. One of these is the big derecho storm that we had. Um, I'm trying to remember which of these it was. One of these is that, that huge that huge storm that we had. Um, it's really fascinating as you start going through, and, and I should add, there's a public site. Uh, if you go to, to the website, gdeltproject.org, um, and you go through the blog portion of it, um, there's actually, um, if you look for TV part, um, there's actually an interactive website for this. We can pull all 2,200 uh, plus emotions and basically uh, see them across American television. So you can actually drill down. You can switch, uh, I believe you can switch by station as well. Um, so the ability to really see a lot of this. Um, again, news media is not um, everything. Um, and so news media tells us what's happening today. It doesn't tell us why it's happening. And so um, this was another piece of this project was uh, in collaboration with the US Army, assembled from JSTOR, which is one of the big aggregators of, of academic journals, 100% um, of their holdings in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, from DTIC, which is sort of the Library of Congress of, of, of the US military, all of their material. And then from the Internet Archive in their first uh, pilot, um, scanned all 1.7 billion PDFs that they've ever found from the open web. Uh, and this is part of a, a larger work that I have with them of, of how do we unlock all 19 petabytes that they hold for academic research. Um, and essentially the idea of this project was, well, what if you took all the world's academic literature um, that covered uh, social cultural issues, and you extract out every ethnic, religious, social group out of that. Um, you pulled out um, every location, all the major themes, uh, and then the citation graphs, so all those papers that are cited there. Um, so what you can do is you can drill down, and you can say, for example, these two groups are fighting, say, in this area, and then you can say, well, um, you know, these two groups fighting over water, um, you know, for example. Let's say some news, ar some news article comes out today. It says these two, these two groups are fighting, these two local tribes are fighting over water access in this area. You can then go over, you know, go back to the 21 billion words of academic literature that, that span 70 plus years uh, in here and be able to say, um, who are the top most cited uh, academics who, who are the, supposedly the world's experts on that particular issue? Those two groups fighting over water in that area. 
Um, and that ability to then connect it. So a news article comes out today and says this is happening, instantly then you can annotate that and say, uh, well, here's why these two groups are, are historically known to fight in this area. Oh, and here are top experts. Um, and this was a, actually a great example of, of the cloud platform. Um, I basically got this, this massive shipment of, of, of a ton of this material all at once and had to process it really, really fast. Um, so of course, you know, that, that's one of the things I, I love about the, the cloud is, you know, the ability to just spin up instantly. Uh, in this particular case, 64 cores, you know, 64 cores, a quarter of a terabyte of memory, and literally, you know, within a, a, you know, a few minutes, you know, you just instantly have myself a nice, a nice little cluster there. Um, and of course, you know, we're all familiar with the cloud, uh, but that's, I think, one of the, one of the fascinating things, and, and specifically for this particular project, um, some of the things, so there's a lot of tools out there to extract citations, so to go to the end of an academic paper and pull out those citations at the end. For a human, that's pretty trivial. Uh, the problem is there were over 2,200 academic journals um, that we got all the content for to feed into this. Um, believe it or not, uh, in academia, um, journals don't have, you would think that every journal out there would have a standard way that you cite the papers that you're using. Uh, it turns out this certainly is not the case in the humanities and social sciences. So 2,200 journals had, I can't even count how many different ways of citation. So essentially what we had to do was try out all these different pieces of software, that, you know, out there in the library information field, tons of people have written tools to extract citations from all these different formats. The problem is that many of these tools, you know, someone maybe wrote this tool six years ago. So it needs some weird arcane library that hasn't, you know, been written, you know, it was obsolete when they built that tool. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges that I've always faced, you know, doing this type of work is that, you know, so all of a sudden, you know, I need this library, it's maybe a 15-year-old library or 20-year-old library. Uh, you know, and I need to somehow install this on a modern operating system. Uh, and I know that, you know, there's a high likelihood this is going to completely destroy, you know, break this machine. So that's, what, that's what's so wonderful to me as a side anecdote about the cloud is the ability that, you know, historically, I had a real physical machine in front of me. Um, and if it turned out that installing that library broke something, now I was just, I'm going to waste, an, you know, half a day wiping that machine down, you know, reinstalling everything, getting that back up to, to bear. So I love about the cloud is I spin up a virtual machine, I do all this and oops, that thing just broke and that machine's dead. Oh well, you toss it aside, you, you know, a few mouse clicks later you have a new one. So the ability to really sandbox things really, really fast. Um, and that's kind of a, an arcane technical error, but you have no idea, like, especially when you're trying to prototype new techniques, like a lot of these, some of these emotional dictionaries, um, some of them have very, very arcane requirements. Some of them are very simple, some have very arcane requirements, or this one required, um, I believe it was an 11-year-old uh, library um, was needed for one of these, which was incompatible with anything, any of the modern operating systems. Um, so this took days, uh, uh, and many, many virtual machines were sacrificed um, in the name of, of, of making that happen. But this is, again, one of those, those wonderful things of that ability to, you know, just, just you know, to, to, to look at things in a, in a whole new light. And again, being able to think about how all this information comes to bear. And, and again, then the ability to then take those 21 billion words of academic literature, pull out every ethnic group and um, out of all that, and look at how they're interconnected, at least through the eyes of the academic literature over this time. Um, and then being able to go beyond that and say, well, you know, if you want human rights information, for example, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the United Nations, they have these wonderful archives. Um, but there's no way to, you know, you can do a, a keyword search on Google and, and search across this, but we're more interested of, you know, what are global trends? Who's doing, you know, who is Amnesty, uh, who is Amnesty saying is doing waterboarding right now? Um, who does Amnesty say is, is doing different forms? How are different forms of torture, government repression spreading across the world? Um, so this is a project then, a special project to ingest uh, the entire holdings of, of each of the, the major human rights groups uh, and codify all of them. So now you can go and say an article saying that, you know, these two groups are fighting and instantly you can access, well, who are the top academic experts? in that. Um, you know, are there, are there any known, uh, uh, you know, are either of these groups known for human rights abuses? Again, that ability to keep adding layer after layer of information to all this. Um, and then the ability to answer the, 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 the really interesting questions, like are global protests increasing post-Arab Spring? Uh, and the ability to, to actually literally make a timeline. So, so, imagine, so go back to the beginning where I said, you know, we take each of these news articles and we pull out the list of, of everything that's in there. Um, as of today, um, that data set covers 1979 to present. Uh, it covers uh, over 300 categories of events and it totals around 275 million records. Um, so essentially 205, 275, you know, basically a giant, data, a giant database, 275 million rows um, times uh, 58 columns, um, capturing so many different details of, of each of these events. So the ability then to really go over that and be able to understand, for example, that yes, global protests are increasing post-Arab Spring, but we're only noticing that because, uh, you know, we've had 20 years of relative silence. There was a lot more intensity of, of global protest activity in the 80s, uh, being able to drill down to a particular country. 
Uh, and then really the interesting abilities, uh, so this is a particular map I did with the US Institute of Peace, uh, where we actually take, we actually make a live dashboard, pink is protest, red is violence, and we go through each of this all this data each day, we make a clickable map uh, where they can actually zoom in and see what's happening around the world, uh, and, and say, wow, you know, what, what's this thing that's happening way down here? Click and then actually see the news coverage emerging from that area, um, and, um, and, and, and of course, uh, you know, and, and this of course brings me to, you know, well, well, you know, how is Google Cloud, you know, supporting all this? How do you actually do all this stuff? Um, well, again, you, you, you can imagine ingesting this much material each day um, from a variety of partners throughout the world. Um, you know, there's a heck of a lot of ban incoming bandwidth each day. Um, and, and again, that's one of the wonderful things about the cloud. Um, so in, um, in 1999, uh, actually, in 2000, so I founded my, my first web company in 1995, the year after the web, Mosaic, the web browser came out. Uh, and I actually went to work at the supercomputing center, NCSA, where Mosaic came from, and worked with some of the remnants of the original team that are still there. And so in 2000, we launched this big project to try and do web scale web mining. You know, basically crawl the web, scoop it all up, and data mine the heck out of it. Um, in, in the year 2000, you could actually do that at an academic institution because there was enough bandwidth to do that. Um, by about 2004, um, by at least where I was at Illinois, that was impossible uh, anymore. Um, there was a, a project uh, that I was collaborating with um, at the computer science department um, that when they started up their crawlers, um, they would consume upwards of 90% of the entire bandwidth of the entire university. Um, and this is the problem, is the supercomputing centers that sit at these universities, they have incredible, almost unlimited bandwidth between the supercomputing centers, but not to the outside world, the commodity internet. Um, and you think about, you know, the type of stuff we're doing, which is ingesting enormous amounts of material, really the, you know, the, the cloud is the only place you can do that today. Uh, and specifically, the pricing on things like Google Cloud. So you think about Google Cloud, you only price on external, you're only priced on outgoing bandwidth, not incoming bandwidth. So if you're doing something like, like what I am, which is essentially scooping up, you know, the, you know, uh, the, you know, not the internet, but you know, scooping up a lot of material each day. Um, essentially what you're doing is, is consuming enormous amounts of material looking for certain things. So you might consume, uh, you, know, uh, you know, billions of items, and out of that just a tiny fraction is actually relevant to protests or coups or other things. Um, so you know, those, those pricing capabilities are, are enormous. Um, the ability, of course, um, so, so my data set um, is all freely available. You can go to gdeltproject.org and download it today, all 275 million records. Um, you know, that's a, you know, if you download the entire data set, um, you know, everything, including the knowledge graph, you're looking at a few hundred gigabytes, which doesn't seem like a lot of data, uh, but imagine now multiplied. So it's had uh, over a million downloads by August. Um, so the six months up to this past August, it was over a million downloads. Now multiply that and you start seeing the bandwidth numbers start racking up. Um, and specifically, also, you think about this, so a project like this, we've got all these, these, you know, these, these cloud machines, all these, these um, uh, virtual machines running. Um, I don't want to publicly expose any of those virtual machines. Uh, you know, they're consuming stuff. I don't want to have to deal with the security issue of, well, this is running a web browser, so if I don't patch it, you know, someone's going to crack it. Um, that's the wonderful thing about, that I love about the Google Cloud Storage is the ability to just have all these machines shovel stuff out to the cloud, to the cloud storage, and then so basically sort of the world's ultimate firewall, if you will. Uh, you know, I can have all these, all these machines back here totally protected, and anything that I want publicly consumed, I route out to Google Cloud Storage, um, and that way, you know, I, I don't have to deal with the public, you know, the, the public serving. Uh, the other piece of it is spikes. So, for example, um, you know, I've had uh, some of my columns for Foreign Policy magazine um, that have generated enormous uh, surges. So I'll have, you know, just a massive surge of downloads, uh, you know, starting within within, you know, maybe an hour of, of that post going up. Or let's say the New York Times runs a piece. Um, you know, we have these massive, sudden, massive spikes. Um, again, that's that's the wonderful thing of, of cloud storage. Is, you know, if you're sitting there with my own virtual machines, all of a sudden, you know, I've got to worry about about load uh, bearing, about um, you know dealing with the load balancing of that, spinning up the web, uh, spinning up web servers, dealing with all that. The wonderful thing about cloud storage is it's no longer my problem. Uh, you know, the moment I set it out there, um, and it's also very interesting. So the original, originally, this this full data set, um, very precious few people were able to, to were able to actually download the entire data set uh, because there's simply not enough bandwidth sitting within a university to allow this much data to be widely disseminated across the web uh, because you, you know we, we like to think about universities as having sort of unlimited bandwidth but believe me um, universities have very very tiny bandwidth even the big engineering schools for the outside commodity internet um, and so the problem was that very few people were able to download the entire data set. Um, the wonderful thing now about saying cloud storage is uh, basically it's essentially bandwidth unlimited. Um, uh, you know, if, if you sit on a fast enough connection, you can essentially slurp up that entire thing uh, the time it takes you to go down the hall and get coffee. Um, and, but, but this is the, but I think the most exciting part to me is, is BigQuery. Um, and, and that to me, so from, from the dawn of this project, um, you can imagine, you know, 275 million records. And you might say, well, that's not a very big database. You know, any, you know, even MySQL can handle that. Yes, MySQL, you can load all that into MySQL. 
Um, the problem is that traditional databases assume uh, that you have a very large data set, but you're only ever going to interact with a tiny bit of that. And that's sort of the, you know, what I always love talking about, you know, and, and my next book from Wiley really delves into, you know, into a lot of these definitions. You know, what is big data, who's doing big data, and all that good stuff. And my definition is always, it's not, big data has nothing to do with the size and characteristics of your data set. It's what you're doing with that. Uh, an example I always love giving is, is um, CERN, um, I think it was maybe two years ago, um, CERN published, um, you know, it runs the cloud, they published uh, uh, this wonderful thing about all their data sets. And they talked about, well, they had a 100 petabyte collection. Uh, and of that 100 petabyte collection, 80 petabytes of that was sitting on tape storage, long-term tape storage. So yes, you have an enormous amount of data, but if it's sitting on tape storage over here, you're not doing anything with it. Um, and even then, uh, you know, very few people are looking across all 100, 100 uh, petabytes of that. They're pulling out very small pieces of that. Um, and, and so traditional databases, yes, you can load all 275 million records in the MySQL, and if you have a nice index column, you're pulling from that index column, everything's wonderful. The problem here is that, remember I said each event has 58 fields attached to it. So it turns out that almost every single query that was coming in uh, basically was asking for a different combination of those. And, and oftentimes you'd have queries, it was, not, it was not unusual to have a query that was involving 10 or 20 columns. Um, you can't do anything about that. Essentially, you're reverting to an unindexed environment. Uh, even if you use some of these tools, you know, things like Oracle or others that can automatically watch load, bear, load traffic and try to build indexes, it doesn't work when every single query is distinct and unique. Um, and the other problem, of, of, of course, with this is that specifically what I'm more interested in is not, you know, find me all the, all the protest events involving Syria in this time state in this location. Well, what I'm interested in is well, what are the underlying patterns? What are the underlying hidden patterns that we've never seen at these scales? Um, so that brings me, so, so to me, the real power of BigQuery is, is A, you know, from the dawn of this project, I never actually had the ability to go through and actually look at the data holistically. I knew how many records were there, um, but I couldn't do it. Like that protest uh, graph I showed you a few minutes ago, I could not generate graphs like that because it took several days um, on the database equipment that we had uh, to be able to do simple draws like that because of the number of columns, the number of, of different things you're doing with it. Um, and so that's the nice thing about BigQuery is this, this is in real time. Uh, you know, this entire data set now sits inside of BigQuery. It's a public data set inside of BigQuery, so you can just basically pull it up in BigQuery and, and go to town on it. Um, and so for the first time, I could do something like, uh, you know, uh, make me a map of, of protest events over time. Or more importantly, uh, you know, the total number of, uh, the total volume of news coverage over the world um, that's available in digital form has increased exponentially over the last uh, 35, 40 years. So if you, if you just measure raw number of protest events in any country, it's going to skyrocket over time uh, because, you know, there's a lot more news coverage that we have out of Russia than we had in 1979, at least in digital form. Um, so you have to normalize. What you do is you take the total number of protest events, you divide by all the coverage you have. Um, well, again, with BigQuery, it's, it's trivial to just have one single query that does all that for you. Um, and that's great, and, and BigQuery was, was, was tremendous for that. But the question that I, the, the number one question I always got was, what are the, are there fundamental underlying patterns to world history, you know, the, the psychohistory types of stuff? Um, you know, are there fundamental underlying p uh, patterns? So that's where BigQuery, that to me is, is really where BigQuery shines. Um, so, um, it's, and basically, I'll, I, I won't explain the graphs too much. Uh, there's a, a whole big in-depth piece we did on this. But essentially, the question was, um, rewind the clock. Let's rewind the clock and say, you are now, you know, earlier this year, the day, the day the president of Ukraine has fled. So the president of Ukraine has just fled the country, and you're trying to figure out what the heck's gonna happen now in Ukraine. So imagine being able to say, um, so you're, you're sitting there on that date, you make a timeline, you say, here's the last two months of, of everything that's occurred in Ukraine. Make it basically a timeline of, of, of sort of physical unrest in the country. Make that time over the last two months, and then say, let me look over all of world history for the most similar periods of all of world history that are most similar to, to the last two months of Ukraine. Now again, you know, looking over just the last 35 years or so. Find each of these periods across any country that are most similar to right now. What happened after each of those periods in world history? Um, take the, the, the most similar couple periods and average together what happened after each of those, and it turns out that you actually get a gra you actually get a, a, an eventual forecast that uh, it's about 0.6 to 0.8 correlated with what actually happens. Now again, what you're measuring is, is not you know it's not truly cycle history because you're getting media effects in there. Uh, you're getting so many different things, but fundamentally you are getting uh, and it turns out it, it actually does uh, match what certainly what um, what um, the macro zone. So again, it's not telling you you know at, at 5:05 the Friday afterwards you're going to have a protest followed by this followed by this. What you're getting are macro scale. It's gonna, you know for example it says well the country's going to be begin falling apart, then it's going to restabilize for a bit, and then it's going to start fluctuating outward. You get very, very macro scale. Um, and what was fascinating about this was um, this was a single SQL query in BigQuery, one single line of code, um, two and a half million correlations it's having to run, two and a half minutes later and you have it. 
Um, and that to me, so you think about, because this query, um, uh, this query was something that was of enormous interest to me from day one of this project. It was you know, one of the fundamental reasons for doing the project. Um, and again, you, know, you could sit down, you could write some MPI code, you could do all kinds of stuff. There are lots of ways you could attack this problem. The problem is that you know, going into this, there was certainly no literature out there that said that you should find, I mean, lots of people talk about the cycles of history, but no one had done this quantitatively. So there was nothing to suggest that this would generate anything even remotely useful. Um, and again, you wouldn't actually make real life forecasts based on this. Uh, but again, this is showing that there's something really fundamental there. There are patterns there. Um, the problem is that uh, you know it's so. The problem is that that basically doing the data management to brute force your way over that many correlations, uh, over that much data, would require so much you know programming. It would take you know many weeks um, to optimize it because again you, you, there were a lot of other things that you have to go. It, it's not a, quite as simple as it sounds. Um, and so the challenge is, you know, that's a lot of investment for something you have no idea whether it works or not. And that was the nice thing about BigQuery is, and this is again, this is not, so you think about every database platform out there today, they all support Pearson correlations. Every database platform can do a correlation. The problem is that most database platforms assume you've got a big data set and you're going to do a query to say, I only want this tiny slice and this tiny slice, see if these two align. So you may have 275 million records, um, but you, you know, take a big platform like Oracle or any of these other platforms out there. Um, they're really designed to use those indexes um, to really strip down how much of that actual data that, you know, the bare minimum that you actually touch. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you can't optimize your way out of a Pearson correlation. You know, the, you can't. You, you actually have to do some computing. And that computing is, is not hideously expensive. This isn't a, you know, a fast Fourier transform. Um, but it's still not cheap. It still requires CPU time. Um, and ultimately, in something like this, there's no way to optimize your way out of this. You literally have to basically take all two and a half million uh, two-month windows that exist if you look at each country and you know by day there's two and a half million uh, possibilities here there is no choice but to take this and literally correlate it against two and a half million of these uh, and rank them there's no there's no way out of that and so really it's just brute forcing your way over a heck of a lot of processors um, and that's the wonderful thing about bigquery is it's, it's you know see again I, I used to be in my old days again a supercomputing center you know I was a performance person I wrote MIPS assembler code um, you know I wrote uh, some of the packages for some of the original performance stuff uh, you know I was deep into that hardware. You know, I was looking at memory transfer rates and doing fancy DMAs to graphics cards to different, you know, between processors. I was doing, I was doing that type of creative stuff. You know, I've sort of pivoted all the way today. You know, I'm less interested, to me, computers today are a tool. I'm less interested in writing, you know, uh, performance code. I just want something that's magic. You know, I love magic. That, that, that you know, uh, we all do. Um, but that's, you know, that, that's what's been powerful about here is the ability to do something like this. To say, you know, I have no idea if there's anything useful here. There probably can't possibly be anything useful here. Um, but the ability to write a single line of code, um, two and a half million correlations, two and a half minutes later, uh, and it's just, it's just magic. And you can also, the other nice thing is you can do things like regular expressions out of this, um, which again, there's no text here because we can't redistribute the text of the articles, just that codified representation of there's a riot and all this stuff. Uh, but you know, ultimately, um, you can actually encode some interesting logic inside those regular expressions and just basically put a regular expression out there and just blast it across that data. Um, so that to me has, has been fundamentally, uh, you know, has been something that's been fundamentally fascinating is, is the ability in, in Felipe Hoffa, um, who, who's, um, I, I think he's what, developer relations for BigQuery at Google. Um, he, he has a wonderful demo he showed when he was out here a couple weeks ago um, with a Wikipedia where he was looking at, take this Wikipedia article and look at the views over time. He did this wonderful live demo. He, he does amazing live demos where he literally said, here are the Wikipedia views data for a couple months. Clicks and literally downloads that data and says, let's load that in the BigQuery right now, live demo. Click the button and it just starts streaming in there. And he says, now what can we do with this? So then he just pulls up a query, just loading in there as he's going. And he just does a query. He says, well, this page right here, when people look at this page over time, what are other pages that have correlated views. Clicks a few buttons, he has a live demo. Um, I, I'm never good at live demo, so I don't attempt to do. Um, I'm usually jinxed when I do them. Uh, but you know, that to me is, is a fascinating ability. The ability to then take a data set like this and start saying, well, you know, protests in, um, in Ukraine, what are, the, what are Wikipedia articles? What, when protests occur, what are, what are other topics that, get, that um, really um, sort of drive discussion uh, during, during those things? What are other types of data sets? Imagine being able to, to uh, leverage climate or all these other things and, and be able to look at, at mass, uh, mass correlations there. And I want to end on, on, on this slide. This is not a Photoshop slide. This is actually a real image um, at the NASA Science on a Sphere um, uh, uh, thing. It's really, really neat. It's basically a picture of a six-foot acrylic sphere hung by invisible threads from the ceiling with projectors around. Um, for all the world, it looks like there's literally a six-foot globe like literally floating in space in front of you, slowly spinning. Um, and we actually feed that now with the data. So you can actually stand there and actually watch the world go by and watch protests and violence and other things move uh, and slowly spin. 
Um, and, and so again, this is, this is really my, my, my vision, my, my dream is, you know, how do we essentially take all this world's information uh, and leverage the cloud to basically bring all that and compute all that uh, and then make that freely available as a platform for, for fundamentally reimagining uh, how we understand ourselves and understand the world around us. And, and this is my uh, contact information and the URL of the project. Uh, thank you so much.